Viola Fogel from, she's the head from the lab of Applied Mechanobiology, the Department of Health Sciences and Technology of the ETH in Zurich, Switzerland. She will be talking about how immune cells wrestle with their prey. I would like to, sorry, how do I switch forward? I would like to draw your attention to an issue that um, uh, is of greatest interest to our lab and we try to uh, define many, many new mechanisms regarding the question, if you have proteins that get stretched by mechanical forces, how do they switch the function? And it's all based on uh, the assumption that if you know the sequence of a protein, you know the structure, then there is a structure-function relationship. And if you then plot and accumulate all that information and uh, draw nice signaling pathways, you will one day be able to predict all cell functions. And um, in most of the signaling networks, you do not see which of the interactions are controlled by mechanical forces. But um, it's probably not difficult to, uh, to, um, to understand that if you take an equilibrium structure of a protein and stretch it, either buried residues get exposed or other epitopes get destroyed. And um, if this is the case, then certainly you can switch by mechanical force into other signaling pathways and switch cell phenotype. So I would like to illustrate you how neglecting mechanical forces in the interaction of immune cells with of macrophages with bacteria and in other processes really um, leaves us not understand crucial events that are happening. So first, let me show you here a macrophage, and since we have eaten now a few um, hours ago, um, let's assume this is now a surface in your body infected by bacteria, your E. coli, and um, your immune cell, your macrophages are highly active, and they start clearing out and clear up. So um, all the receptors, ligands are there, and the question is how efficient are macrophages? So you see that despite the fact that this macrophage is really active, um, the bacteria divide every 20 minutes. And the big challenge for the macrophage is uh, each bacterium is adhesive and interacting with the surface with many, many receptor ligand bonds. And so the macrophage really has to grab this bacterium and first rip it off the surface before it can even start a phagocytosis. And so at the end, you see that um, the macrophage was very active, but we lost the race against the infection. And um, it boils down to the kinetics of bacterial division versus um, the uptake rates, which determine finally whether or not we have a chance to survive an infection. And um, our question therefore was, what determines the kinetics of um, um, or the rate by which macrophages can take up bacteria. So let me show you a macrophage in much more um, higher detail. So you see it has these sticky fingers that first poke and um, adhere to a bacteria and then pull on bacteria. And, um, and then later on the lamellipodium um, is moving forward and engulfing a bacteria and taking it up. So um, if we analyze many, many of the kinetics, what do we learn? First of all, from the literature, we learned that E. coli has these long hair, those are fimbria, and then the macrophage contacts them with philopodia, seen here. And on um, the philopodia is a receptor, it's called CD48, that is highly manosylated. And uh, the fimbria has a, a, um, a receptor um, with a binding pocket for mannose, and that structure is called FIMH. Since uh, you have one FIMH per fimbria, uh, per fimbria, this contact is mediated by a single bond. So, um, and, oh, what can you learn from that? So, if we analyze these videos in great detail, we see that once a philopodium has uh, contact with the bacterium and starts pulling, this philopodia can survive for 40 minutes or longer. While when the philopodium is just poking and not finding anything to eat, it pulls back, um, 
and the lifetime of the phenopodium is a minute or shorter. So the surprising part was that this is mediated by a single bond, and um, that can be explained by the fact that Prim H um, with Manos forms a catch bond. And um, a couple of years ago, we identified this, this, this as the very first um, bond that was shown to be force activated. And um, we always thought that Prim H helps bacteria to adhere to surface like in our urinary tract that get flushed. But now we see that macrophages utilize the same bond and if they pull on it, it's activated, and therefore it can survive 40 minutes or longer. But furthermore, the, if the macrophage is now pulling just on the philopodium, the force generated is not sufficient to pull the entire bacterium off the surface. So guided by the force, the, the membrane is protruding, actin is polymerizing in this direction, so guided by by the macrophage having a hook, it can now protrude the lamellipodium. And rather than breaking all bonds at once, um, the way it picks up a bacterium is that it pushes its, lam its lamellipodium underneath, breaking bond by bond by bond by bond, and that is easy to do. And then you see how the bacteria are lifted on top of the lamellipodium, and then the phagocytosis can even start. So much mechanical work needs to be done before a bacterium can be taken off. So um, is that important to know? Is that just nice to observe in the lab? And there are many um, unexpected findings. So, so the first one was, um, as mentioned, we thought that these Prim H manus contacts help E. coli bind to surfaces through these interactions via the catch bonds. Um, the pharma industry, um, after seeing that so many, and uh, seeing that the cost of developing new antibiotics is really high, and seeing that so many strains um, are emerging with resistancy, um, uh, the next uh, type of drugs that were developed were these anti adhesive drugs, where people thought if you add them to a medium, if, the, if you add them to food, they might um, prevent bacterial adhesion um, to surface in the first place and therefore reduce infection. However, this was not really clinically very successful so far. So we added these soluble inhibitors that were all um, identified in equilibrium screening assays, anyway already targeting the weak and not the strong state. Um, if we add them to our um, cell culture systems and we looked at the uptake rate um, of bacteria by macrophages. Here you see the rate without soluble inhibitors. Here you see the rate with a soluble inhibitor. So the soluble inhibitor addresses and targets the same bond that um, the bacteria otherwise use to adhere to surfaces. So if the soluble inhibitor blocks this bond, it also blocks the formation of the hook. In these data, you see how important the hook is to regulate the uptake and to speed up the uptake by macrophages. So if you add these soluble inhibitors, um, people never thought about the fact that it might then compromise the rate by which our macrophages can take up bacteria because it, uh, macrophages were not included in these screening assays. So um, the second part is if you have a bacterial infection with E. coli, urinary, urinary tract infection is uh, number one. Um, typically you are treated by these type of antibiotics. You take a pill in the morning and then you have high concentrations and they might kill the bacteria. But uh, some bacteria will survive and then as time progresses, the antibiotic concentration will come down. And then the bacteria can survive. But there's one process that is still inhibited and that is a fully divided bacterium. The last step for the bacteria to live individually is to cleave, pinch off the membrane. You need one protein and that can't be synthesized. And so instead of, of living as individuals, um, um, E. coli forms these long filaments in the presence of antibiotics. And uh, we then asked, okay, what is the impact of filamentation on the uptake by macrophages? And here you see one macrophage binding 
through the filament, pulling on the filament, distorting the filament. Um, this video is 40 minutes long and the macrophage was not able to break it apart. Another video, uh, sorry, this was started here already. Um, another video here, you saw that this macrophage was able to reach the pole and then we can form an actin ring around it and we can start the phytophotropic process. So depending on how the filaments hide themselves and hide the poles in tissue, a macrophage might or might not be able to make proteins. Another factor that we never considered in the way of how we apply antibiotics. You see the necessity of drug delivery systems to keep the antibiotic concentrations really, really high for this not to happen. So, um, okay. The next question we are asking in the moment is certainly developing all kind of essays, but also more information about the mechanics that are ongoing. And so in the moment we were uh, started asking the question, can we uh, engineer a carrot that looks like a bacterium and just dangle it in front of a macrophage? And then really look at the way, like if you play football, the way you approach the ball, how do you contact the ball? How do you um, rotate maybe a bacterium so that you can better take it up? And in order to do such an experiment, we started to collaborate with um, Brett Nelson, uh, who is a wonderful colleague at the ETH, who had just developed an eight-coiled magnetic tweezer system. And this, um, the emphasis is on eight coils, which allows um, not only to trap a spherical part particle and control its movement and then the forces that are applied in this direction, but we want to have a particle that we can control in all three directions and then we would like to, to mimic rod-like particles. And so these eight coils allow us even to control the position of a rod-like particle, to look at the torsion on a rod-like particle and measure all the forces involved. But then certainly we can add, um, we can functionalize the particles with molecules of interest in the presence or absence of drugs and um, other molecules of interest, cytokines and other things. So to show you a first example, we pick up a magnetic bead and put it in front of a macrophage. And then you see how now the macrophage start um, approaching the bead. We can either um, move the bead, put it into a, a certain position, and then just monitor how it gets displaced by the macrophage. Or we can keep it under constant force and then see how the macrophage really pulls on the bead and rotates on the bead. And then measure all the kinetics, all these trajectories. And um, here you see this movement in more detail, um, how the macrophage approaches. And we see already totally interesting um, behavior that is so different of what people could see with um, um, optical tweezers before, like pushing movements, but with very gentle forces. So with that, um, mechanical forces play a major role. Here I showed you an example how um, the existence of the hook was essential and it could only form because we had a force activated bond, we had a catch bond. We look into many other, we look into many other binding motifs, sorry. Um, and um, can you just go back a second? Okay, so we look into many um, other motifs. We saw that um, you, by force you can destroy or open up antibody binding sites. Um, we found that a uh, uh, bacterial binding motif from S. aureus is destroyed if you stretch extracellular matrix fibers and many more intra and extracellular binding motifs are currently discovered by the community and we all try to put that together into a mechanical framework Thank you. Thanks very much for such interesting presentation. We have one question here. Really, really beautiful work. Um, what implications does that have on the type 4 secretion systems when they first link into the lumen? 
and by the disruption of that, do you think you could actually go ahead and change the flora and fauna of the gut for the replacement of the flora and fauna? Right. So the fimbria that um, um, are used here are type one pili, not, and so um, I'm very, very careful with speculations because we see in the moment that every protein that is part of mechanical networks works differently and in a different force range and how these force ranges and kinetic ranges are tuned to their biological environment. So um, I'm very careful um, suggesting implications because typically we found that the implications were different from what we initially thought. Are you, are you planning, or maybe you did that, did you change the surface of these magnetic particles that you are moving with the, the magnetic tweezers to, to look at the interaction of the macrophage with, with the surface? So those are all ty the type of studies that are underway right now to really understand how receptor ligand interactions, if then um, under mechanical tension, can change this uptake behavior. Thanks very much. So let me thank to all the speakers and you for joining us. And we have 15 minutes break and a plenary session. Thanks very much.